Parrish. I am the Associate Director of Education and Public Programs, and I am part of the team that helps organize events like this that we really hope sort of amplify the exhibitions that we have um, in our galleries. And as you know, right now, it's all about fashion, craftsmanship, and luxury goods made in Italy after World War II. And as we were thinking about programming uh, for this exhibition, we sought the advice of a lot of folks around um, Portland and really the state. And I distinctly remember being down in Corvallis at Oregon State University at their apparel design program, which by the way is over 100 years old and nationally ranked. And I didn't know that prior to working on this project. And we were meeting with some faculty and students and a faculty member leaned over and she said to me, you have to read this book, The Coat Route. It tells the story of a single $50,000 coat and the way it was made, the provenance, and I was like sort of writing this down because I'm a total nerd about that kind of stuff. And I came back to the museum and I remember talking to my colleague Betsy, who's here in the audience, and I mentioned this book. And I went out and I bought it at Powell's. Betsy got it from the library. We devoured it in a weekend and we both said, we have got to invite Meg to come talk about this, this book. So here we are today. And Meg has joined us from the wintry north of New Hampshire to be here. She's very pleased that it is so nice in Portland. And just a reminder that after her talk today, we are going to be selling copies of the coat route outside, and she will happily sign one for you. So before we begin, let me just give you a little bio on Meg. She has spent 10 years as a correspondent for Outside Magazine, and she's written for the New York Times, National Geographic Adventure, Travel and Leisure, Esquire, and Men's Journal and Vogue, among many other publications. In 2013, The Coat Route was named by the American Society of Journalists as the best general nonfiction book. She has two daughters, she's a graduate of the University of Vermont, and as I said, she currently lives in New Hampshire. So please give a warm spring welcome to Meg Lukens Noonan. Thank you, Stephanie. And thank you to the Portland Art Museum for inviting me and for mounting this spectacular Italian style exhibition. Um, I saw it yesterday afternoon and I was moved to tears by how beautiful the garments were and just the romance of that period just kills me. Um, and thank you to all of you for even thinking you might want to hear someone talk about a book she wrote about one overcoat. <laughs> I, I know that it requires a, a leap of faith and um, believe me, I, I go to cocktail parties and uh, someone will say, what do you do? And I say, I'm a writer. What do you write? I said, well, I, I just wrote a book about a coat. <laughs> and they sort of back away and have to refresh their drink. And, you know, and I get it. It's very, very strange. Um, sometimes they're intrigued enough to want to know a little more about the coat. And they generally want to know where I found this spectacular overcoat. Well, the short answer to that is Google. <laughs> <laughs> but the longer answer begins on a tiny island just south of the Arctic Circle in Norway. This is the island of Lanen. I'd been a magazine writer for about 25 years, mostly writing about adventure and travel. And I got an assignment to travel to this island and write about the residents there who come back every summer to tend the wild eider ducks who migrate there every spring to lay their eggs. And just as an aside, I did this seven years ago and the article is in this month's Coastal Living magazine. <laughs> <laughs> That's sort of the life of a freelance writer, but it's there. Um, so what these people do who come back in the summer, they, they used to be year-round residents, but they, they now just return in the summer. In, right around now, actually, they go back. They have a series of little duck houses all over the island that they come back to, they make sure they're in good shape, they put, them, put fresh seaweed in the duck houses, and they wait. 
And sure enough, the ducks come ashore, they lay their eggs, and when they leave the nest, they leave behind this lovely puff of eider down, which is considered to be the finest down in the world. It's the lightest, it's the warmest, it's the rarest, and of course, it's the most expensive. So I went to this island, I walked around with them on their daily rounds. They had 600 houses that they checked daily to see if the ducks had left the nest. And I collected the down with them. I drank schnapps with them at breakfast. <laughs> it was wonderful. Um, but I was so taken with the idea that, oh, I need to say, they, when they have collected all the down and cleaned it all by hand, they then make seven or eight down comforters a year, which they sell for about $8,000 a piece. And of course, they are considered the ultimate down comforter. And I was so taken with the idea that something that could be considered the height of luxury is being made in the most remote, imaginable place, um, using methods that have been used for 1,500 years. And I thought if I could find eight or 10 other products like this, things made by hand using very labor intensive methods that are used to produce something that is considered the ultimate luxury, that it might make for a nice little book. So I came home, I dried out from the schnapps intake, <laughs> and I started Googling. I Googled best in the world, ultimate luxury. I found things like vinegar and very strange things that didn't quite fit. But one day, I found this website. This is the website owned by a certain J.H. Cutler, a tailor in Sydney, Australia. He said he had made the ultimate Vicuna overcoat. And I looked at it, and I thought, hmm, that's sort of interesting. I clicked around a little bit, and I found out that the coat had cost the Canadian businessman who commissioned it $50,000. And this is the coat. <laughs> I, I didn't understand. I, why does this coat cost $50,000? I don't think it's the best looking coat, it's kind of boxy, it's sort of plain, it looked like something you might find on a clearance rack somewhere. And I was very curious why someone would pay this much money for a coat that didn't even have a label, it was basically a generic. No Armani or Versace to flash when you sat down. It was bespoke. The website said it was an unparalleled expression of the bespoke tailor's art. At the time, I wasn't quite sure what bespoke meant. I had a vague understanding that it was sort of a fancy way of saying custom. But I'd started seeing it in, in advertisements for spas and, and for travel agents. And I, I looked into it a little more, and I found out that bespoke has a very specific meaning. It's a tailoring term that means clothing made from scratch for an individual using a pattern created just for them using measurements and created to their specifications, the kind of fabric they want, the shape of it they want. That is bespoke. The word originated 400 years ago when a man wanted a garment, he would go see his tailor, he would reserve or bespeak a length of cloth. And from then on, that cloth was bespoken for. No one else could use it. That's where the word came from. Of course, it's been adopted by a lot of different businesses these days. And tailors, by the way, are, are very unhappy that their word is being bandied about like this. They, they don't think it's right. Um, and they even sued some companies to try to get them to stop using the word. But they lost because it's become so much a part of our vocabulary. So I looked around at this website, and I found out that the coat 
had been sewn without a single machine stitch, which apparently is rare even in the world of bespoke tailoring. Even the finest tailors will use a machine for the long seams, but not this one. It was made of the softest, lightest, and most expensive cloth in the world, spun from the fleece of the wild vicuna, or vicuña in the Spanish. These are small, llama-like creatures who live at high altitudes, only in the Andes. The buttons were made of water buffalo horn from a 150-year-old button factory in England. The lining was the finest Italian silk. There was even an 18-karat gold plaque sewn into the coat here that had been engraved by one of the only master hand engravers in the world. He had done Princess Diana's wedding invitations and made a gold signet ring for Prince Charles. And I thought, there is so much interesting stuff here. I think I maybe could write a book about this coat. <laughs> So I, I wrote this crazy long email to my agent and said, I want to write a book about a coat. I want to go all over the world, and I want to go to all the places where the materials came from, and I want to meet the people who were involved with the, these materials. And she wrote back, could work. <laughs> and when you're a writer, could work is like, yes. It, <laughs> To me, I, I thought I'd just snagged a, a three-book deal with you know, motion picture rights and everything. I was so excited. So the next step was to write a book proposal. In nonfiction, you don't have to write the entire book before you go looking for a publisher, you, but you have to do a very detailed proposal. And the first thing you have to convince a potential publisher of is that you are the one and only person to write this book. Well, this was my first problem. I knew nothing about men's tailoring. I live in New Hampshire. People rarely put on a tie, never mind suit. Um, I, I didn't have a great reason why I should be the one to write this book. But one day, I was folding laundry and putting clothes away. I had two teenage daughters. And I was stuffing things into their closets and their drawers. And it was almost entirely clothing that we had purchased at places like Forever 21, H&M, really crummy clothes. <laughs> and I looked at them, and I looked at the fabrics, and I saw how they were peeling and pulling apart, and the, the way they felt, and I thought, I could use this as a jumping off point to talk about this coat and the way most of us buy clothing these days. I mean, I grew up, and I imagine many of you did too, going shopping twice a year with my mother. We went in the spring for spring clothes, summer clothes, and we went in the fall back to school time. And that was how stores brought their inventory in twice a year. It made sense. But in the 1980s, technology and globalization changed that timetable. Offshore factories using cheap labor allowed clothing makers to drop prices. And then shoppers became more savvy about trends, basically through the internet, and they wanted them right away. So fast fashion was born. And, and don't get me wrong, I, I, a side of me was very happy that you could go outfit two teenage girls for not so much money. I mean, my kids would pile things up, and it would come to less than $100, and we would felt like we had really scored, you know? Um, but I started to realize there were consequences to shopping like this. Synthetic fabrics, which most of these garments are created with, use huge quantities of oil. Cotton requires massive amounts of pesticides. And then these clothes are so inconsequential in our lives, they're so inexpensive that it's easy to dispose of them without giving it much thought. Um, you know, I'd like to think that I give most of mine to the thrift shop, but the fact is sometimes I just throw them away and I'm not alone. Americans discard 13 million tons of textiles a year. They only recycle about 15% of that. 
And they're throwing away four times more clothes than they did, we did, 30 years ago. And the other problem that fast fashion has created are these factories, mostly offshore, mostly staffed by people who are not being paid very well, and often they're working in conditions that are, are terrible. Um, so I looked at these clothes, and I thought about that coat. And that coat was the antithesis of the clothes in my house. And I thought that would be my way in to tell the story. The next thing I had to do was gain access to the people involved in the making of the coat. So I snooped around on Google. And I found email addresses for some of them. The tailor right away was on board. He loved the idea. And he was able to tell me a few of the people involved. Almost all of them said yes right away that I could come visit. And yes, they'd be happy to tell me about what they do. I mean, people love to talk about their work. And, and they were delighted to be asked. That was my sense. But there was one person who I could not get a response from. I'll tell you about him in a minute. The button maker, Peter Grove. He thought I was peculiar, I could tell. But he said, yes, I could visit his family factory outside of Birmingham, England. In the hills of West Yorkshire, England, I found Brian Dolly. Brian Dolly's a luxury textile consultant, and he said yes, he will show me the mills that are spinning the raw vicuna fleece and weaving it into this fabulous cloth. And then I got really lucky. I found an American scientist named Jane Wheeler living in Peru. She's one of the world's leading experts on vicuna, of all things. And I wrote to her, and I said, I'm writing this book about a coat, and I want to know everything about these animals. And she very kindly invited me to come to Peru and to go see the animals with her. There's a fascinating backstory about these lovely creatures. As you can see, they're a relative of the llama, and they're the sweetest looking things. And you can sort of tell from the the look of their coat, that their fleece is just unbelievably soft. In the Inca times, vicuña were herded into makeshift corrals very gently, sheared and released. The Incas actually believed they were gods, and they treated them accordingly. And only royalty was allowed to wear clothing woven from the vicuña fleece. But when the Spanish arrived, with guns, they started mowing them down as soon as they realized how wonderful their fleece was. And this went on unchecked. People believed you had to kill them to get the beautiful fleece. When the Spanish arrived, there were a couple of million of vicuña on, in South America. By the 1960s, there were about 5,000 left, at which time, they were declared endangered, and all tra trade was halted. But then conservationists had a great idea. Why not reinstitute the old Inca roundup? They called it the Chaku. And give the villagers who live near the Vicuna's habitat a stake in the fleece that was shorn. So they did it. People would go out and form a human, excuse me, human chain in a big circle and walk forward. And when they'd gotten close together, they had a couple hundred vicuna in the middle of their circle. And then they would funnel them into a corral and shear them. So she said she would bring me to see that. This is at about 15, 14,000 feet, by the way, very high. I also managed to get myself invited to a field day on Savile Row in London. It was crazy. They put grass down on the street, on this little street that is considered the world hub of men's luxury tailoring. And they brought sheep in. It was to promote wool. Prince Charles was behind it. He's 
got those kind of wacky ideas that actually was, were fabulous. And luckily, on this day of the open house, all of the tailoring establishments were letting people come in and just look around. And they were giving talks about the origin of the tuxedo and when the queen of Tonga needed a new outfit for her coronation. And it was just fascinating stuff. And I never would have walked into these places if it hadn't been this open house day because they were so intimidating. They were like gentlemen's clubs and, and it would be really frightening to just walk in and you don't browse in there. I got the owner of the coat, Keith Lambert, to say I could come meet him and his coat <laughs> in his apartment in Vancouver. I was actually shocked that he was as willing to do this as he was, but I believe that his affection for John Cutler, the tailor who made the coat and many of us other garments, he had such great affection for him and wanted him to continue and to succeed that he was willing to sort of open up his closet, literally, to me. And the tailor, John Cutler, was eager for me to tell his story, and he said, yes, come to Sydney. Um, so the next thing I had to do was figure out how to tell this story. I mean, how to make this entertaining. I didn't want to write the history of the textile industry, and, and I didn't have the, the skills to do that or the knowledge to do it. But I thought I could weave in the story of the tailor as he made the coat with my own experiences of traveling to see the source of the material and the inspiration for the coat. And that way I might keep things moving along. So that's what I did. And I, I wrote the proposal. My agent, it took about 10 months to write. My agent sent it around. <clears throat> and the odds of me getting a contract to do this were really slim. I mean, I'm not a name writer. I don't have a, you know, I don't have 10 million followers on a blog or anything. Um, but she sent it to a publisher named Julie Grau, who had just published a novel set in a grim button-making town in England. And what do you know, but Julie Grau loves grim button-making towns. <laughs> and I had one, I had one. And she loved it, and she, she bought the idea. So it was thrilling, and I set off on the coat route. I'm gonna read you a little bit from the book, but first I wanna sort of bring you up to speed in the story here. So Keith Lambert was living in Sydney, Australia. He was married to the daughter of one of the richest men in Australia. And he was also working for his father-in-law. And things didn't go well. His father-in-law fired him. His wife divorced him. And he decided he needed to move away. And he was moving to Vancouver. Well, he didn't have a warm coat. He'd been living in Australia. But he did have a lot of money. And he went to see John Cutler, his tailor, and said, I need a coat, what do you suggest? And John knew enough about Keith to know that Keith always wanted the finest. He was thinking cashmere. He wanted the nicest cashmere that John had. But John had in his back room three lengths of cloth that he'd been holding on to for 20 years. They were vicuna black one, a tan one, and a navy one, and they cost $6,000 a yard. And he'd been waiting for the right client. <laughs> and he very, very casually mentioned that he had cashmere was lovely, but perhaps this would be of interest. And he laid it out on Keith's lap, and once you feel this stuff, if you had the money, you'd be sold. So, I'll pick it up from there, and I'll read you a little bit from the book. <clears throat> John Cutler spent the next several days thinking about the overcoat. An idea began to take shape. He was 55 years old. He had no successors. 
He was well aware that he was the last cutler who would ever yield the family shears. His two grown sons had no interest in taking over, and why would they? Bespoke tailoring was a dying art. Cheap offshore manufacturing and an obsession with designer labels had brought custom made to its knees. And a lack of young people willing to put in the years required to learn the trade would finish it off. What if he called on everything he knew about his craft to make this coat? What if he and his trusted workroom team made it entirely by hand without a single machine stitch? What if he used the finest materials he could get his hands on? He already had the vicuna, of course, but what if he achieved that level of perfection with all the other components? Everything he used to make the coat would come from craftsmen who were as obsessed with quality as he was. When Keith came in to be measured, John opened a bottle of wine, a buttery New South Wales Chardonnay, and told him what he was envisioning. I trust you, Keith had said, do whatever you like. Then he had handed the tailor his black American Express card <laughs> and said, take what you need. He had not asked then and would never ask how much the coat would cost. John got to work gathering the materials that he would need. Some were easy. He already had premium silk threads and top-of-the-line horsehair canvases, which would be required to give the garment its shape. The lining, however, was trickier. The fabrics he had on the premises wouldn't do. They were viscose blends, hard-wearing and practical. Yes, but this coat was not just about practicality. It was also about luxury. There was no question that the lining must be silk, and not just any silk. Only a few companies in the world produced the kind of quality John wanted. Hermes was one. He considered the possibility of stitching together several of their superb scarves. Stefano Ricci was another. John sold Stefano's ties in the shop. Perhaps he could take some apart and fashion them into a patchwork lining. Then he got to wondering, why not just ask Stefano if he would sell him a length of his silk? John had done business with the enigmatic Florentine menswear designer for years. He knew the designer's agent in Melbourne, so he gave him a call to ask if he thought Stefano might be willing to sell him some silk. Out of the question, the agent had said, Mr. Ricci would never do that, certainly not to be used as a lining. John sensed that the agent was reluctant to even approach the designer, but he kept pressing. Tell him it is for a vicuna overcoat, entirely handmade, John said, believing Stefano Ricci would appreciate that kind of commitment to artisanship. Tell him it will be of the highest standard. Mention that the coat is navy blue. He would defer to Mr. Ricci's good taste as to the specifics of the lining design, as long as it complemented the fabric's hue. Two months went by and John heard nothing. And then one day he got a call. It was the agent he sounded dumbfounded. Stefano Ricci would sell him enough silk to line one overcoat, but the designer had insisted he must tell no one and he must never ask again. <laughs> well, he did tell someone. He told me. And once I had Stefano Ricci's name, I started hunting for him, for a way to get to him. I found emails for people who I thought might be his assistant. I found an American agent of his who I thought might relay a message. I wrote many, many emails, and I heard nothing. And I told John Cutler, I said, I, I can't get any response from Stefano Ricci, and I need him for this book. John suggested I use the word maestro. So I wrote, Dear Mr. Ricci, 
I understand you are the maestro of silk. I want to learn from the maestro. I want to soak in your maestroness. <laughs> and I laid it on very, very thick. And I kept writing. And then one day, I got an email. And it said, when are you coming to Florence? Of course, I was thrilled. But this presented a huge problem. What would I wear? <laughs> So, of course, I went to TJ Maxx. <laughs> My daughters helped me. Eventually, we went up a little bit. We got some J. Crew things that were deemed okay. And I went off to Florence. And I'll read you a, a bit about my encounter with Stefano. I am sitting in a dark orange club chair made from the skin of wild New Guinean crocodiles, waiting for Stefano Ricci to arrive. This is something I may never do again. <laughs> so I am paying particular attention to the soft window-paned leather and to the perplexing, almost unnameable hue. Persimmon, is it? Or just a half shade more towards paprika? The chair and others like it are placed in pairs on a travertine tiled floor in Stefano Ricci's eponymous boutique, set theatrically in the former armory of the Palazzo Tornabuoni on one of Florence's choicest shopping streets. Art-filled upper floors of the 15th century palace, once the home of a Renaissance era pope, have recently been converted into a private residence club by the Four Seasons. Owners are picked up at the airport in the club's Maserati. With upstairs neighbors like that and a retail block that includes Bulgari, Gucci, Louis Vuitton, and Cartier, it's obvious why Stefano Ricci opened his flagship store here in 2009. The location is ideal for snaring the kinds of customers, think petroleum-rich princelings who crave the 61-year-old designer's exquisite handmade menswear. From my seat, I can see the Stefano Ricci spring collection, displayed with spare and artful precision on burled walnut tables and in tall wardrobes. There are lavender and lime striped Egyptian cotton dress shirts, dimpled ostrich bomber jackets, tissue weight wool suits, slender pointy shoes, and trays of tonally grouped world silk ties, all set off by silver elephant tusk sculptures and large vases filled with exuberant, waxy-looking blooms. A well-groomed salesman stands with his hands clasped behind his back, and a security guard hovers near the door. Both have smiled at me, but I get the distinct feeling they harbor a certain dubiousness about my presence. There are no customers in the store on this unusually warm morning in late March. I shift my position in the squared off chair and jiggle my foot. Outside, a church bell rings and groups of tourists walk by heading toward the Duomo a few blocks away. And then Stefano Ricci arrives. His entrance into the store is operatic, an audible sweeping in. He is short and wide with a spectacular mane of longish salt and pepper hair swept back and curling past his collar, a full white beard and dark playful eyes behind glasses. His suit is a wonder of fluid navy wool, cut just so to broaden the shoulders and skim the ample torso, a bear in a man suit. <laughs> Mrs. Noonan, he says in a little song that trails off into a sigh. I rise to shake his hand and the hand of Filippo Ricci, Stefano's trim 27-year-old son and the company's R&D manager who was at his side looking efficient 
and thoroughly exfoliated. <laughs> I sit down. Stefano takes a chair behind a desk, and Filippo takes the one next to mine, pulls an iPad from a black leather case, and puts it on his lap. You don't mind if I smoke, Stefano says, pulling a cigarette from a pack. He points one finger skyward towards the stained glass panels 40 feet overhead. High ceilings, he says. An elegant blonde woman places coffee in a very small porcelain cup on Stefano's desk. He looks at me and takes a long draw on his cigarette. So, he says. It took months of emails to get this meeting arranged. I'm still not sure what he's willing to do. I'm hoping for at least 20 pure minutes of Stefano Ricci time. I clear my throat and ask him how he got started in the menswear business. As a boy in Florence, Stefano was an enthusiastic doodler. Filling the margins of his school papers with small figures, paisleys, and swirls. He also had an unusual obsession with neckties, Hermes neckties to be specific, and by the age of 20, he had amassed 150 of them. His mother, who was in the clothing business, connected the odd dots and suggested that young Stefano put some of his drawings on his own neckwear. He started making silk ties and found that he could not stop. It was like a fever, he tells me. Even after 40 years, every design starts with Stefano noodling around on paper with a fountain pen, often late at night in a miasma of smoke with opera music blaring. His ties are made entirely by hand, using only the best raw silk and the most labor-intensive printing process. The finished products are vivid wonders that beg to be fondled, luminous, soft, and supple, but substantial enough to produce a beefy Windsor knot and a deep, authoritative dimple. The designer's neckties, which start at $200 for a basic model and go as high as $35,000 for a limited edition one studded with diamonds, are considered by many Thai aficionados to be the best in the world. My passion is to design ties, he says, for the opportunity to play with color and warp and weft. I am not an artist, I'm not talented, I am a technician of cloth. And I must say that everything, I do everything from start to finish. It is one of the privileges of the profession. From neckties, Stefano moved on to shirts of the finest cotton, always with his signature octagonal mother of pearl buttons and contrast micro stitching on the collar and cuffs. He branched out to crocodile belts and platinum cufflinks and silk robes. Every item is made one at a time by a team of 200 artisans, either in the designer's small factory just outside Florence or in nearby ateliers. Stefano doesn't like to say who his customers are, but it has been reported that Hosni Mubarak, Nelson Mandela, Tom Cruise, Robert De Niro, Mikhail Gorbachev, the Sultan of Brunei, and Prince Musa of Bangladesh all wear Stefano Ricci. Most Ricci devotees are not celebrities, however. They are anonymous, worldly, rich men who have developed a craving for that particularly potent sartorial crack that Stefano Ricci pushes. I design my clothes for people who don't need my clothes, Stefano says. They are attracted by the idea of having something special. They try once and they want more because they feel good in what they are wearing. Thanks to God, they get addicted and they want to possess. <laughs> like other Florentine fashion designers who preceded him, Ferragamo, Gucci, Pucci, Cavalli, Stefano Ricci grew up in a world where the virtuosity of the artistic hand was a daily fact. 
not just in the city centers, architecture, paintings, and sculptures, but in tiny workshops across the green waters of the Arno River. There, in the Altrarno, shoemakers, carvers, tailors, weavers, and goldsmiths were carrying on the legacies of the medieval craft guilds formed in part to assure the quality of the work. Their predecessor skills had helped make Florence the epicenter of fashion and style during the Renaissance, a position the city held until the 17th century, when Paris began to overshadow it in all things cultural. In 1951, Giovanni Battista Giorgini, a savvy local straw hat exporter who was determined to get Florence back on the sartorial map, staged a small fashion show in his villa and invited American apparel buyers. Eight buyers and one journalist for Women's Wear Daily stopped in on their way home from seeing the Paris collections. Women's Wear Daily ran a front page article about the show and the emergence of Italian style. The ripple of interest generated there had turned into a tidal wave by the time Giorgini presented a larger show in July 1952, this time in the Sala Bianca of the Palazzo Pitti. Buyers were dazzled by the refined but relaxed clothing and by the scenery, the food, the parties. It didn't hurt that the clothes were about half the price of French fashions or that several of the featured designers were bona fide aristocrats. On a hot July evening, under the crystal and gold chandeliers in the white ballroom of a palace that had been home to grand dukes and kings, the Americans fell hard for the romance of Giorgini's ahead of its time marketing message. That craftsmanship mattered, that heritage mattered, that provenance mattered. Made in Italy was on its way to becoming what it would remain for the next 60 years, a label that instantly conferred quality, sophistication, and connoisseurship, and stamped your visa for entry into La Dolce Vita. So as I talked to Stefano, I looked at my notes and I had a few questions I was going to ask him. One was, how do you define luxury, Mr. Ricci? And as I was about to ask that, he looked at me through the haze of smoke and said, I think you are a writer, not a journalist. He said, you cannot believe the questions journalists ask me. How do you define luxury, Mr. Ricci? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, dodge that bullet. <laughs> but for whatever reason, I was very grateful that Stefano Ricci decided he liked me well enough to let me tag along with him for the day. And not only that, he wanted me to go see his silk screening operations in Como. And he arranged for me to do that, got me a train ticket, had someone meeting him there, meet me in Como. And he said to me, now you see, you go see why Stefano Ricci is so expensive. And I did go to Como and I did see why it is so expensive. It was spectacular to see the screen printing happening one frame at a time, starting with white silk and watching the pattern build one screen at a time. Stefano Ricci uses 13, 14, 15 colors. Most silk designers use three or four or five. Uh, it, was, it was just fantastic. Now, obviously, Stefano has been very successful. And he has successors. His two sons are involved with the business. And it's going great guns. They've opened boutiques all over the world. But some of the people, other people I met were less enthusiastic about their futures. There were two things working against them. The lack of young people that wanted to come in and learn the trade, a trade that would often take years to not even perfect, but to get decent at. And then there was competition with China that was killing them. In particular, the button maker was suffering. Peter Grove 
at the height of his family business, which had been going for 150 years, had 600 employees making the most beautiful buttons in the world. They made them from water buffalo horn from India, which are considered tops among tailors. When I went to see him, he had 25 employees. And by the time the book came out, the factory had closed. And in the case of Buttons, he was being crushed by Chinese manufacturers. There's one town in China that makes two-thirds of the world's buttons. It's a pretty good bet that most of the buttons on our clothes that we're wearing right now were made in this one town in China, which is mind-boggling. And the same is true of neckties and zippers. They're cranking them out. And it's not that they're terrible quality. They've gotten better and better. But it's just impossible to compete. On the other hand, in my travels, I did find there was a little bit of reason for optimism. There are some apprenticeship programs. Uh, the tailors have set up in England, for instance, where young people can go through uh, a program to learn how to be a tailor and then are taken on as apprentices in one of the old traditional tailoring houses. And the fact is that there are people out there with enough money who are willing to spend it on this kind of one-of-a-kind item that they consider the height of luxury, that they're keeping this world of traditional craftsmanship going. I mean, a lot of people I've talked to are turned off by the idea of a $50,000 overcoat. And of course, it's an obscene amount of money. And this is the, the extreme end of this. But even $6,000 for a, a, a wool bespoke coat is a lot of money. But what I tell people is, because there is this world of people who are willing to pay for that kind of level of quality and craftsmanship, they're keeping this other world alive. And, and I was so impressed with uh, the passion and the, the caring that the people I met put into their work. It was, a, it was a, just a wonderful, wonderful experience. I'm, I'm going to leave you with one sort of interesting little nugget about what ended up being the book cover. My publisher sent me a mock-up of the cover to see what I thought. And there was a label. It was very similar to this. Um, this is not the exact silk lining, but it's very similar to the one that was in the overcoat that I wrote about. But the stitching around the label was very amateurish looking. And I said, I don't think that's good. I think that it looks, you know, it looked like I did it. It's terrible. And she, they said, well, the art director wanted it to look like that because it really looks handmade. And I sent it to John Cutler, the tailor, and he said, absolutely not. He was horrified. He said, I'll do it. And the deadline was the next day to have the art done. And I told him that, and he said, don't worry, I'll have it to you yesterday, which the international dateline and all, I, I, he was kind of right, but he sent back this blue label, which is actually on the Vicuña cloth, hand-stitched. You can see the precision of these tiny stitches. And, uh, and that's the cover that they went with. And, and I was so pleased that John had a, a hand in it, and I know he was too. But. So I'm happy to answer questions if anyone would like to know any more. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and we, we have microphones, so if you would raise your hand, we'll pass you a microphone so everyone can hear your question. So how did you deal with the whole issue of uh, using the lining and only using it, being able to do it once and the only customer when you'd seen him? I mean, how did that all work? Because it's obviously public now. So if you were sort of, you know, 
trying to skirt that, how did it all work? Well, I think in the end, uh, Stefano Ricci's ego is such that <laughs> it wasn't really going to be a secret. And when I told him that he would be an entire chapter in the book, <laughs> he, he came around. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes? Italian? No, I did not. I don't speak Italian. The question was, did I conduct the interview in Italian? I do not, but he speaks perfect English. Yeah. Are, are, the, uh, are the other craftsmen that were mentioned in your book, are they all still in business? They are. Um, John Cutler, the tailor, has had a nice surge in his business, partially in thanks to this book. It did come out in Australia uh, as well, and he got a, a fair amount of publicity out of it. And he recently wrote to me and told me that business was buoyant. <laughs> <laughs> um, the others, the goldsmith, who I didn't tell you much about, but he's also in Sydney. And he uh, has steady work. And he has a son who's learning the trade as well. So he seems to have this niche that he's going to be able to maintain. Uh, the cloth makers are still going, especially with the very, very high-end cloth. Um, there is a demand for that. There's a lot of new wealth out there. The Chinese are very interested in, in looking like English gentlemen. Uh, Downton Abbey had a, an effect. It, they actually called it the Downton effect on Savile Row. Uh, and Americans in particular went and ordered clothing that would make them look like grouse hunters on, you know? <laughs> Um, so yes, uh, the, the only one that actually went out of business was the button maker. Can I make a comment about that? Yes. Thank you. He, uh, he's mentioning that he heard that the button maker had regrouped and is back in business. And I was aware there was uh, an effort to get the Grove machinery back up and running, and it's great to hear if he is. That's wonderful news. He's a nice man. Right here? You mentioned that Ricci starts with white silk, but then made it white silk, or does he screen it white, and then he puts the other colors over the white? Um, so the question is, Stefano starts with white silk, and does he screen it white, and or is it just in its natural state? He, it's in its natural state, it is not screened white. My understanding is that most natural silk before it's printed is sort of an off-white, and Stefano uses a pure white. And I honestly don't know how he gets the pure white. I, I, I assumed it was some sort of gentle bleaching, but I'm not certain. It's a different worm. It's a different worm. Is that right? So, so you can you can select for very white silk. I, I did hear that Italians are going to start raising silkworms again, which is wonderful. Yeah, because they they did, and then it they, it 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 all went to China, but they're going to go back at it, which I think is exciting news. How are the Vicuna doing? The Vicuna are doing fantastically well. Uh, they did a, a census recently, and the population was up to, I think it's something like 300,000 in Peru alone. I mean, it's, it's one of the great success stories in the world of, of conservation that this animal's been, been brought back, uh, and they're doing fantastically. When the button maker went out of business, who was able to take over his place? Did they have to go to China, or was there someone else? Oh, so the question is, when the button, this button maker went out of business, was there any other business that could, could fill that gap? I guess you mean with that level of quality. Yes. There are a few other makers. Um, I, there's one in Germany I know about that Savile Row tailors told me they buy from. And I think that the Chinese are getting better at um, are making better and better buttons. Part of it is that they brought talent over from Europe who know how to do this. So Peter Grove would say that they're nowhere near the quality that he had achieved, but tailors still find a place to buy them. 
Um, I understand you've seen the exhibit we have here, and there is a segment of the exhibit in which uh, the dressmaker, the fine quality dressmaker, would you uh, say that that type of tailoring, that dressmaker's work that is upstairs, would be on a par with the kind of thing that John Cutler is doing in Australia? And do you happen to know whether that craft of fine dressmaking, fine tailoring in Italy is surviving um, or in other places in the world? Well, so the question is, is there an equivalent to in the, on the women's side to bespoke tailoring? Um, and is that being carried on? And I, I think that would be the world of haute couture, um, which I don't know much of anything about, but m my understanding is that that incredible level of craftsmanship is is put into those those garments in Italy and wherever the the great designers are working yeah yes all right i'm going to go where angels go to trail okay how do you define luxury <laughs> <laughs> are you a journalist or a writer <laughs> um well, that's a good question. How do I define luxury? I mean, I, I think it's more, for me, experiential. I, I felt that I, it was a luxury for me to get to go to these incredible places and meet these people. Um, and, and I think experience, for a lot of people, um, is, is considered the height of luxury. I don't have beautiful luxury products. I appreciate them. I can't afford them. I think, wow, that would be nice someday to have a beautiful bag or a beautiful coat. Um, but I, I think I think that, that the, the world of, of one of a kindism, if you can say, is very interesting. And if I had the money, that that's where I would put it, um, and that would be the height of luxury to me. I was wondering about the uh, owner of the coat. What did he think of your book? She was wondering the, about what Keith Lambert, the owner of the coat, thought of the book. He said he liked it. And I, I, was, I was nervous with him, because he's a, he's a very private man. He's a very quirky guy. Um, when I went to see him, he, he carried a little dog everywhere he went. and. We went out to lunch, and he put a, a white towel on his lap and let the dog sit on the, his lap while he drove. And this is a very unusual character, but he did like the book. And, and again, as I said, I think he liked it because it, it shone a light on his dear friend, John Cutler, and, and gave him hope that, that he would continue making these beautiful clothes. There's one way back. One more back. Uh, definitely. I, I at least am aware in a way that I wasn't before. And I, I, don't, I don't buy things without giving it a little more thought than I used to. Um, I, the idea of buying fewer things but of better quality is sort of an old-fashioned notion, but it's one that people who wear bespoke hold dear, and it's one that I've tried to sort of incorporate a little bit into my life. And, and I'm happy to say my, my two daughters read the book and, and I think also had their consciousness raised a bit um, about these clothes that are, that are you know $10 jeans and $13 dresses to think about what is this stuff? Where is it coming from? Who's making it? And do we really need another dress like this? Um, the only problem with that idea is that now my kids, who are now 23 and 20, will say they want a new dress. And they'll say, you know, that's a little pricey. And they'll say, but mom, you know? You, it, <laughs> quality. It's about quality. <laughs> 
and I say, get a job. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Take one more. You had said originally there was one person who wouldn't talk to you. Who was that? Oh, that was Stefano. Oh. Stefano was the one that was the tough nut to crack, but yeah. <laughs> Okay, I think we're, we're good. Um, so Meg will be outside signing books if you're interested. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you very much. <laughs>